In terms of what I am, uh, I'm an African at the level of identity. I, I won't go much further than that at the level of identity. I am an African. I think it's pure uh, and simple. Now, in terms of the realms of ideas now, um, philosophically, I'm what's called a philosophical materialist. Ideologically, I am what is called a humanist. Um, politically, um, I advocate for Africa to have a continental-wide superstate, so that it's governed as one united entity. And economically, I advocate for our production me mechanisms to be the most advanced technological uh, mechanisms in the world, in the experience of humanity. Now, when you put those four things together, that is economically industrialization or advanced technology way beyond industrialization, basic industrialization, uh, a state mechanism continental wide, a humanist philosophy um, uh, and a materialist, uh, sorry, a humanist ideology and a materialist philosophy. When you put those, uh, those things together uh, with the fact that I'm an African, what you have is a pan-Africanist. You have to have all of these components to be a pan-Africanist. So, if I was not an African, I couldn't be a Pan-Africanist. I could support Pan-Africanism. I could be an advocate of Pan-Africanism. I could champion, in many respects, Pan-Africanism. But because I was not an African <laughs> in that theoretical uh, makeup, it would mean that I couldn't actually be uh, a Pan-Africanist in the same way that a, a, a man cannot be a mother. It's integral. Um, your, the, the, my philosophy, um, which is materialism, uh, it demands that I must be scientific in my approach. We might say a little bit more uh, about that later. Uh, and that scientific element is a requirement for Pan-Africanism. The opposite to that, of course, would be uh, the notion of mysticism or magic. Um, the scientific, uh, the uh, Pan-Africanist uh, automatically uh, looks for scientific uh, explanations. And we know that this is the way that African people have operated in millennia. African people created the pyramids. African people created the first calendar. African people actually worked out that it takes 26 thousand years for the universe to make one complete rotation. You can't do that mystically. You have to have the most advanced and profound scientific mechanisms in place in order to achieve something of that magnitude. So you have to have that in order to be a Pan-Africanist. You have to have that, that methodological approach. At the level of ideology, you can, either, um, you can either be a materialist, sorry, a, a, a humanist, as I am, that is, that um, people are the highest priority. People are an end in their own right. People are more important than money. People are more important than profit. You, know, you, you can either have that as your base, or you can have uh, the opposite of that, which is exploitation. Exploitation which is where um, people are somebody else's tool. People are a means to somebody else's end. So we, in, 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 exploit, exploiters use other people rather than engage with other people on an equal basis. So to be a Pan-Africanism, you must have humanism as, your, as the center of your ideology or the central principle 
of your ideology because we're not here to use other people, we're here to interact with other people to make the world a better place with and for other people and ourselves. Uh, and then comes the politics. Now in the African situation, what we have are lots of jigsaw puzzle states. At one point there were 52, we're losing count now, it's moving up to 54, 55, you know, we lose count as, they, as, they, as the jigsaw puzzles get smaller and smaller, as they splinter and splinter, and the little uh, jigsaw puzzle states argue amongst themselves. A Pan-Africanist must work towards one continental-wide superstate. This is absolutely essential uh, for a Pan-Africanist. So unity is an essential component of Pan-Africanism. Fragmentation, what Nkrumah calls balkanization, the divide and rule, the splitting up, the compartmentalization, all of those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things are alien to Pan-Africanism. So if you are not for a continental-wide superstate, you cannot be a Pan-Africanist. And then the final of those, uh, those categories is the economic uh, category. And it's about how do we produce? Do we produce just using our hands? Or do we produce using tools? If we produce just using our hands, then um, we have a, a kind of low level of production. If our pr production is only in agriculture, growing the food that we need, then we have a, a low level of production. But if we produce using tools, and if we make those tools more and more sophisticated, we find that we can produce more. Uh, and it's that, um, that's the, that's what Pan-Africanists are looking for, for the developmental part of Africa to be at the highest of heights so that we can feed our people, we can educate our people, we can look after the interests of our people, and we can look after or work with nature in order uh, to make you know, living better for African people and other people uh, in the world. So those are the four components or the five components of what it is to be a Pan-Africanist. So I'm going to start by looking at the notions of society and nation. Now, now these are abstract terms. These are, you know, a society. You can't actually touch a society. You can't make the physical connection with a society, nor can you do that with a nation. These are constructs. They are mental constructs. We have them in our minds. We have a sense of what they are. But how do we tangibly show what they are? In order to demonstrate what they are at the basic level, we're not going to go into great detail here, but in order to demonstrate what they are at the basic level, what we need to do is to ask ourselves, what are the physical ingredients that go to make up the society or the nation? Well, we know that the major ingredient is nature. All societies exist in nature. There's no such thing as a society outside of nature. So this then shows us what one of the critical ingredients uh, of um, society and nations are, the environment within which they exist. So nature is composed of a number of elements, four elements to be precise. We know that the sun represents fire that the oceans and the rivers represent water, that the land that we walk on, the base upon which we exist, represents earth, and that all around us 
we're surrounded by air, which represents gas. So all of these are critical ingredients, which we call nature, of a society or a nation. It's not possible to have life without them. It's not possible to have a society without them. It's not possible to have a nation without them. But there is another critical ingredient to societies. You see, plants cannot create societies. They are living things, but they cannot create societies. Flowers cannot create societies. Trees cannot create societies. They're living things, but they cannot create societies. Snakes can't create societies. Lions, tigers, elephants, pigs, dogs, cats, none of them are capable of creating societies. The one other critical ingredient for society is an aspect of nature known as people. Why are we such a special ingredient? We are such a special ingredient because we have a higher level of consciousness. Our consciousness is higher than the plant. Our consciousness is higher than the other uh, uh, creatures, animals. Uh, on this planet. And that extra ingredient, that high level of consciousness, makes us critical to society. In fact, we can look at what separates us from, say, the animal kingdom. Human beings are the only creatures on this planet to have mastered fire. <laughs> Other animals, if you put them close to fire, they will run. In the opposite direction, of course. But human beings have mastered fire to such an extent that we can use fire in a cold country like England to warm our homes, <laughs> you know, when it's freezing outside. This is a remarkable achievement for any animal. And it separates us, that consciousness, that ability separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. The other thing that separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom is our ability to use tools. Human beings use tools. There, is a, there are cameras filming this process right now. No other creature on earth has the capacity to create a camera. No other creature on earth has the understanding to make use of a camera even after it has been created. We use tools. No other animal in the world uses tools apart from the occasional use by primates apart from the occasional use by some birds who will use stones to uh, break shells, or birds use, in a sense, use tools to, to build their nest. So why do I say this? I'm saying this because the two critical ingredients are for a society and a, a, and a nation are people and nature. So now we need to make some connections between um, people and nature in order to understand concepts such as society, concepts such as uh, a, a nation. Now, one of our greats, the great revolutionary Amilcar Cabral, explains to us that the relationship between people, one person relating to another, or one group relating to another, that relationship, that interaction, is politics. You see, when we do this in small groups, when two people converse together, 
That's called small p politics. When we do our little bits and pieces in the community, when in our groups we converse together, that's called small p politics. Now, when we multiply that by a massive scale, when we bring it onto the national level or the international level, the interaction between nations, you have what is known as big P politics. The politics of governance, the politics of power, who's in charge of whole nations. So politics, at its simplest level, we know from African culture, is the relationship between people. Now, as we move on to economics, economics is the relationship between people and nature. The very act of interacting with nature is economics. So as people engage nature, they operate economically. Now, again, when we do this on a small scale, this is described as microeconomics, small scale economics. But when we do it on a massive scale, when we do it on a large scale, that is called macroeconomics. That's the economics of, the, uh, of a nation. That's the economics of the world. That's a macroeconomics. But then comes the notion of ideology. What is ideology in essence? Remember we started with our physical components at the very beginning? The physical components of people and nature. And people and nature, when applied in relation to each other, people to people produces economics, people to nature, sorry, people to people produces politics, people to nature produces economics. Now, our ideology rests on the politics, the people-to-people -people interaction. It is how we interact with other people. Now, if we... Uh, so, so we can describe that actually as the manner of interaction with other people. If we interact on a humanist basis, the essence of humanism is that people are treated as an end in their own right, then that's one way of interacting with other people. If we interact with other people as though they are our tools, that they are our means to an end, then that's exploitation, another type of interaction. It, these are the principles of a society. So the core principles of any society, anywhere in the world, is either humanism on the one hand, the shorthand for that is people before money, before property, before profits. And uh, on the other hand, it's exploitation, property or money before people, or profits before people. That's the core distinction at the level of principle between different types of society. There are other principles which flow from those core principles. One of those is collectivism. So the humanist is naturally collective. We all work together for a collective end. The opposite principle, which is uh, uh, synonymous with exploitation is individualism. The shorthand for, um, uh, for individualism is me before we. I put myself before other people. The shorthand for collectivism is we before me. I am a part of the collective. The third major principle that comes at the ideological level is on the one hand, egalitarianism. This is the notion that we are all equal in principle. 
in essence. We are all equal in essence. It doesn't matter that we have different abilities, but we are all equal in our human essence. Whatever our abilities or disabilities, we all have that innate human dignity, which is to be respected at all times. So we're all equal. That's egalitarianism. The opposite to that is elitism. That is, I'm better than you. You're there to serve me. I'm better than you. I think I'm superior. Man thinks they're better than woman. European thinks they're better than African. <laughs> this is elitism. It is the foundation of uh, racism. It is the foundation, white supremacy being uh, uh, you know, a more specific term for, for racism. It is the foundation for white supremacy. It is the foundation for sexism. It is the foundation for classism. So even within a nation like Britain, for instance, they argue amongst themselves as to who's better. And they put their queen on top. And, you know, whoever they regard as their dregs, they put down below. So these principles are opposing principles. And those principles define the ideology, the ideology of a society. They define the ideology of a nation. So the next category is the highest category. It is the philosophical category. And we go back to the beginning again, that people and people, our physical people and people, our physical entities give us politics, and people and nature, when you put them together, uh, give us economics. Now, how we treat nature defines our philosophy. Do we treat nature as an end in and of its own right? Is it something great, greater than us, that we respect implicitly in everything that we do? That's one approach. That is the uh, approach which philosophically is called materialism, philosophical materialism. Philosoph philosophical materialism must be distinguished. It must be distinguished from the raw, rancid materialism of capitalism. We're not talking about the same thing here. So we're talking about philosophical materialism. The counterpart to that at the philosophical uh, level is those that decide that they're going to treat nature as a means to their end. Those that decide that they're going to reduce nature to being a tool. I use nature for what I want. I want the oil in the soil of Nigeria. To hell with nature, I'm getting the oil because I want to run my motor cars. I want the ingredients in Africa's soil so that I can make nuclear weapons capable of destroying the earth. To hell with nature, I'm just going to go and get it and I'm going to make these bombs and destroy the earth uh, if and when I feel to. The, these are behaviours which are at the base of the opposite side, which is idealism, philosophical idealism that nature is the servant um, uh, 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 of people, not even the servant, because in a sense, nature does serve us, but that's not the, that's not the, 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 the proper language, actually. That nature is subordinate to people, that somehow people have a right to do whatever they like with nature. It's a particular mindset that underpins um, uh, the philosophical idealism. So the philosophical materialist sees nature as the source from which we get spirit. There are some branches of philosophical materialism which will claim that you've got nature 
but there's no such thing as spirit. Remember, we're speaking philosophically here. So there will be different trails of thought. On the other hand, you've got idealism. And idealism uh, takes the position that spirits are the source of nature. That spirits brought nature into being. There are some branches of philosophical idealism that say that there is no such thing as nature, that everything around us is just our imagination, that everything is spiritual. <laughs> and so even though we can touch things, uh, even though we can see things, they're just imaginary. So this is a, a line of thinking. Uh, there's a line of thinking which goes even further than that in terms of philosophy. And within that philosophy, what they would say is that there is no such thing as the physical, the material, that nature doesn't really exist. And there is no such thing as spirit. There's only nothingness. <laughs> Nothing exists. Now, I'm not suggesting that people need to believe these different schools. I'm just saying that these different approaches to philosophy exist. So, for instance, um, the last one that I described, that neither spirit nor nature exists, is an absurdity in and of itself. And I won't even go into an explanation on that one. If you look at the, the, the other branch uh, uh, of idea, or another of the branches of idealism that I tried to express, this is the idea that everything that's physical around us is not really real, it's just imaginary. If that's true, and if you really believe that, and some people do, then what you do to test it scientifically is you take a gun, you put the gun to your temple, you pull the trigger, and of course, because nothing is real, you won't be really dead. It is an absurd philosophical position, but some people hold it. Let me just say that uh, in the African tradition, we are materialist in our outlook. We are philosophical materialists. We argue that there is nature, and we argue that there are spirits, that the two parts each exist. We don't deny either of them. And what we say is that in order to get to the spirits, we have to go through nature. We have to go through the physical. This is the African uh, way uh, of engaging. So for those people that meditate, for instance, the first thing that they will do is fix their posture, get their breathing right, because they need to get their physical selves in the right state in order to make the spiritual connection. And African spirituality is a materialist approach. It has to be a materialist approach because it's scientific. The same science that I was trying to describe earlier on in the shop, the 26,000 year rotation of the universe, the pyramids, the calendars, the clocks, all of the things that we created were based on that, 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 that interpretation of philosophy. So what I need to do now is Looking at the whole equation, the, uh, the philosophy, the ideology, the economics, the politics and the economics, is to make the connection. Uh, and what I, the, the position that I'm going to espouse now is that matter is one unified whole. This is a philosophical position now, that matter is one unified whole. So making those connections, 
Uh, politics is the relationship between people. Economics is the relationship between people and nature. Philosophy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, ideology is the manner in which we interact with each other as people. And uh, philosophy is the manner with which we interact with other people, with, uh, with, with nature, sorry, but remembering that people are a part of nature. So our ideology is actually a part of our philosophy because you cannot separate people from nature. So it, it's our interaction with nature, including our interaction with other people. This is what some people would call spirituality. It's actually our relationship with matter. And when we look at them closely, what we find is that politics, sorry, economics is bigger than politics. How do we know this? We know this because nature is bigger than people. We also know that there's no such thing as a person outside of nature. We can use the universe if people want to argue about going into space, nature and the universe being essentially the same thing. We cannot get out of nature. We are always in it. And so for that reason, we're always surrounded by nature. And so this means that politics is always surrounded by economics. It is actually a special part of economics. It is the thinking part of economics. And the rest of economics is the doing part. So politics is the thinking part of economics. And then inside of politics, so the basic point here is that economics is, uh, is, is on the outside. That politics is inside um, uh, economics. But then if you go inside politics to the way that we interact with each other, you get ideology. So ideology is actually inside our politics. And then inside our ideology is our philosophy. The binary inside everything that's happening. In fact, um, in the scientific world, the philosoph uh, philosophy equates to either the atom or the quark. I won't go into an explanation of that here. But what you have are the tiniest of components that determine all the rest. So our philosophy drives our ideology. Our ideology drives our politics. Our politics drives our economics. And we see that the politics being the thinking part is like in the human body, the brain being the thinking part drives the actions of the body. So the politics is driving the doing activities of the economics. Now, all of those activities put together for everybody in existence, wherever they are in the world, or even those that have gone out of the world, out of the atmosphere of the world, onto the moon or to other planets, or things that we've sent uh, to all, uh, other planets, all of those activities, in their sum total, is what we call culture. That is culture. Culture is the container of all human activity. The culture of a plant is the container of all the plant's activities. The culture of an animal is the container of all of that, or those animals' activity. So culture is the container so what is society? And what is nation? Well, society is the base of culture. It's the base upon which culture rests. And society itself, which is abstract, rests on something material. It rests in nature on the land. 
So land is the base of culture, uh, uh, of society. Society is the base of culture, and culture contains your economics, your politics, your ideology, and your philosophy. So all of this activity, our, our philosophy, our ideology, our politics, our economics, contained in culture, sitting on, uh, on society uh, as its base, as that travels through time, in its background is history. So what we're doing is we're making the connection of all of these things to show what a society is. The major point to take from this, and this is African philosophy now, is that matter is one unified whole. Matter cannot be separated. It's one unified whole. The tangible parts, the bits you can touch, the bits that you can feel are there in people and nature. And the intangible parts, what some people might call the physical and the metaphysical, what some people might call the material and the amaterial. Some people use the term immaterial or also. All of those come together to form one unified whole. Nature and spirit are one. And if you study the analysis that I've given very carefully, if you're looking for spirits, you must look inside. African culture tells us that we must look within. And this is what our ancestors meant. That if you want to find that quote-unquote spiritual component, you must look within. Because philosophy is dealing with our relationship with matter, which means that it's dealing with that spiritual element.